All right, salam alaikum. Bismillah, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Welcome home, everybody. It's good to see you, alhamdulillah. Uh, inshallah, I know I said last week was the last passage, but we didn't get to the end. So this week, inshallah, we'll be concluding our um, series, Becoming a Friend of Allah, the lessons, the life lessons from the, uh, from the life of Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Uh, inshallah. Uh, before we begin, um, I know that uh, everybody is obviously aware, but more than just aware, I know that everybody is definitely feeling and hurting with our brothers and sisters uh, across the world. Right? Palestine, of course, Gaza is the one that is most highlighted. Uh, there are other, definitely other crises as well. Sudan right now is uh, entering a very, very da dangerous, precarious stage with lack of food and water. Um, but I think, you know, with, with, with social media and the internet, it's obviously something that is being thrust in front of our consciousness, which is good. It's helpful. It's important for us to be connected. Um, but before we begin tonight with talking a little bit about what we wanted to talk about this evening, I wanted to first ask if anyone wanted to share the emotions that you're feeling, because I think this will help get us to a point tonight with the reflection that we're going to get to, inshallah. Yes. What you feel guilt? Can you explain? Yeah, like being here. Yeah, like just being in a place, feeling safe, having food, having drink. There's a lot of guilt. Anyone else? Raise your hand if you also share in that feeling of guilt. Okay, absolutely. Uh, anyone else want to share? And by the way, there's no feeling that like is more predominant over the other. Like we're complex people. Like you're allowed to feel more than one thing, right? So it's, it's very possible for a person to feel uh, helpless and at the same time to see straight, stra you know, light, uh, um, you know, well, I can't even talk, subhanAllah. It's very possible for someone to feel hopeless and helpless, but to also see the light of optimism in certain forms, in certain ways, right? So we can share everything. So I don't want people to look if somebody says something that you're not quite feeling, right? Hear them out. It's important to share these things. What else? Anyone else? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So empathetic distress, this, this sort of, uh, this fatigue, not because you don't want to care, but in fact, because you care so much that you hit this point of fatigue. And I think you mentioned something. And again, you know, Miriam and I know each other, so this is not like a... I'm not, I'm not saying anything to pick on anybody, but a lot of us probably feel, right? Raise your hand if you feel exhausted. Not in a way that you're like, I'm done with this. No, you're just like, just the existence of this problem is exhausting, okay? And we say things and we feel things, and I say this too, a lot. I want to know what I can do beyond dua, beyond charity, okay? And we'll talk a little bit tonight about what that is, but We'll also try tonight to leave refocused and recentered on just how powerful dua and charity are and really the impact that they can have, uh, inshallah. In fact, like they may be more productive in some ways than some of the things that you might assume are the more like efficient means of providing relief and aid. Anyone else? Yeah. Pride. Okay, beautiful. So you're seeing like the strength of the Palestinians, the, the almost, I mean, not almost, the miraculous response that some of them have. I mean, today I saw this, this man handing out candy because his wife was martyred, you know, and he was like celebrating her shahada, right, that she was martyred and that Allah accepted her as a martyr. And we know that the martyr is accepted into Jannah with no hisab, with nothing, and that their soul is taken from them with no pain. And there's all these incredible benefits of being a martyr, 
And so he's walking around handing out candy to people saying that my wife was Shahid. My wife was Shahida. Um, so that you see the strength. And then also the numbers that you see across the world, right? You see people at the border in Palestine. You see people at the border or at, in Egypt. You see people at the border in Jordan. And despite the fact that governments might not be, you know, active at all, you're seeing the populations and the people inside giving so much and, and exhibiting so much of that care and that even that distress, right? Emotionally bringing them to tears because of the ummah vibe, right? <laughs> you know, the, the vibe of belonging to an ummah, that these are people that I'm not related to and I have no connection with besides the fact that we all agree and believe in la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay, very good. That's, I, I'm, I'm happy you said that because it is, again, there is a silver lining in some of this. There is. Anyone else? Yeah. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, <laughs> we're going to talk about one verse tonight, subhanAllah. Frustration. Who feels frustrated? Especially when you see like manipulated information. I mean, just let's call it what it is. That's a really nice way of saying lies. Manipulated information. When you see lies. And then really when you see people who are, they should know better, but they don't know better. And they're, they're being fed these lies. And you start to understand that subhanAllah, like what, what kind of frustration can be felt when somebody simply is just believing, you know, with everything, hook, line, and sinker, they're believing in something that's absolutely patently not true. Um, and that can lead to a lot of distress. And, and so the reason why I wanted to explore tonight was because some of these feelings and emotions, the Quran addresses them head on because we were talking about prophets and prophets more than any people felt these emotions, right? Prophets felt frustrated, they felt ignored, they felt they were attacked themselves. Uh, they had moments of, of self-doubt and questioning, but they also understood their mission. They understood their role. And what ends up happening, subhanAllah, is that you exist in this very delicate balance. And if the balance starts to go too far in one direction, you begin to feel what we call hopeless. Anyone here started to feel a little bit hopeless and helpless? Especially when you're... I was at the protest yesterday downtown and again, no judgment and I'm not upset because we're all human, but there were some comments being made. And again, these comments are out of frustration. They're not out of uh, defeat. The comments were like, what is this going to accomplish? Right? What is this going to accomplish? And then there are some people I think that are a little bit too strong in that feeling where they say this is pointless. And I, I want to begin by saying, number one, that it is not for you or I to decide what is pointless. That is up to Allah. And as long as people gather to, for the sake of Allah, really, for the sake of Allah alone, to do what is right by pronouncing justice, by pronouncing virtue, and also by trying to be people that communicate care and love and empathy to their brothers and sisters, you have no clue how valuable some of these moments can be. You have no clue. I mean, I know that the electricity and the internet and availability is not plentiful in Gaza, but you have no clue the amount of feedback. I mean, I'm working with charities that are there on the ground and they're showing videos and pictures of the protests all over the world, including America, including London, including the West. And they're saying that some of the people in Gaza are looking at this stuff and they're like moved to tears at the fact that there are Muslims outside of that small strip. I mean, maybe the Middle East, they're like, yeah, there are neighbors, but there are Muslims across oceans, right? Not even only Muslims. There are people who are not Muslim, who are joining in hands with Muslims, with Palestinians to talk about this. And it moves the people in Gaza, the ones that we're chanting for are seeing us chant for them. And it moves them to tears. And so that idea, that notion that, well, what's the point? What is this gonna accomplish anyways? It is truly, and I say this very carefully, without blame or, or, or allegation, it is a very, very satanic whisper. Shaytan is the master of despair. And more than anything, he wants us to give up. More than anything. I mean, even in like what he likes to do, 
He wants people to give up in the mercy of Allah. He wants people in their relationships at home to give up on each other. He loves it when families split apart. Because why? Because that's giving up. He loves when siblings stop talking, when parents stop talking, when spouses give up. He loves that. Because it's the sign of despair conquering the heart of a person. And in this, in this circumstance, in this moment, he wants the ummah to give up. And he's trying his best with all of the shayateen that he employs to whisper into the chests of people that really what is the point of this anyways? You protested yesterday and there's bombing last night. You protest today and there's bombing tonight. You posted today and they posted 10 times more. Right? The manipulation, the lies. So shaitan wants you to kind of be like, what's the point? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in numerous places, reminds us the value and the power of tawakkul. And I'm not saying this from a theoretical standpoint. I'm talking about this practically. When you apply tawakkul. In the story of Ibrahim, there is a moment. And I want to share with you this moment because it shook me. Wallahi, I didn't plan this. I swear to God... I did not plan this. I was reading the verse today, and I was reading the tafsir. The verse, okay, so let's first set up the stage, right? Ibrahim a.s. goes through his whole life. We went through a lot of it. He goes through his whole life encountering difficulty after difficulty, moment after moment of challenges, okay? He leaves. He has to leave his wife and his newborn son in the desert, and then eventually makes his return back to them. When he makes his return back to them, a.s., he and his son, it's, it's, it's disputed whether they, whether they built the Kaaba before or after the command to sacrifice. But let's go ahead and say that they built it before. They raised the foundations of the house of Allah Ta'ala. They asked Allah to accept. Then he's given the command to sacrifice his son. He follows that command. He submits and Allah replaces the, the, the sacrifice order with a lamb to show him that you truly submitted to Allah. I mean, all of these moments, right? All of this actually is going and is building up for one particular moment and command, which is going to end up being the legacy of Ibrahim. All of this was just preparation for what? What is Prophet Ibrahim known for? What action, what pillar of our faith rhymes with fudge? Hajj, right? Okay. Ibrahim, I said, I realized as I was asking, and I didn't see a lot of people like yearning to say it. I was like, okay, we're not going to get this one. So Hajj, Ibrahim, <laughs> Prophet Ibrahim is known for Hajj. That's his legacy. Like when you go there, when you perform the Hajj, you are enacting, you are reenacting the rituals of Prophet Ibrahim and his wife Hajar, and you're doing all of that, okay? So all of the time that we've spent with the story of Ibrahim is climaxing at this moment. This is the moment. This is the pinnacle. Allah Ta'ala tells him, وَأَذْنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجْ now that you've done this, now that you've built the, you've raised the foundations, now that you've established this, now that Allah has taught you the manasik, now that you've done all of this, he tells Ibrahim, okay, أذن في الناس بالحج. Call people to hajj. Now, nas here means everybody. Call people. Ibrahim a.s. hears this, and there's a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu tells us what Ibrahim said in return, because the verse keeps going to talk about how Hajj will be accomplished, right? But he says, when, when, it, uh, bil hajj, ay, nadi nas lahum ilal hajj. So, okay, call them to Hajj, do what you gotta do. So, Ibrahim a.s. faqala, Ya Rabbi, oh my Lord, wa kayfa ublighu an nasa wa sawti la yanfuduhum. He says, oh Allah, how will people hear my call, but my voice won't reach them? Does that sound familiar? What's the point? He's not saying it doubting Allah, but he's curious. Yesterday, when I was at the protest and I heard that from you know, my left side, what is this going to accomplish anyways? And then I read this today, I got goosebumps. Because literally it's coming from the same place. What's the point? Ibrahim is saying, how is this going to work? All of us who are confused about how sharing and protesting and this is, how is this going to work? Allah gives the most amazing answer. He says, what? Faqila nadi. Call. It's my job to deliver it. I will be the one that takes care of that. See, Allah never asks us to do things that we can't do. Allah does not ask us to accomplish things that are not possible for us. That would be unfair. 
there's a there's a maxim in Islamic law that says God would never obligate something that is impossible for human beings. He would never do that. So instead, what Allah obligates is your effort, is that you do something, is that you try. And as Muslims, we operate wholly and totally completely within the realm of it's my job to try and it's Allah's job to carry it to the finish line. But I, instead of worrying about the exact how and the mechanisms of how this is going to affect things and how this is going to reach and X, Y, Z and all of that, I should rather be more concerned with whether or not I'm doing everything in my capacity to try. Some people get stuck in the land of theory. They start talking about things that are way outside of their capability and ability instead of worrying about what they can do. Have you exhausted everything that you can do before talking about things that you can't do? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this to Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he got up, the hadith continues, and he called. He went and he called from different places. He announced in different directions towards the earth. He called out that the hajj has been established. So he called to everybody. Ya ayyuha nas, inna rabakum qad ittakhada baytan fahujuhu. He says, O oh people, your Lord has taken a house on this earth, so make hajj, make pilgrimage. And subhanAllah, what does the hadith say? Fayuqalu. That at that point it is said that when his voice rained out, all of the mountains in Mecca that stood as barriers for his voice, they all started to bow. And they all came down and they lowered themselves until his voice, right? SubhanAllah, even in the hadith, they didn't know physics. They didn't know how sound traveled. They didn't understand that these are waves that are being blocked by physical obstructions. But the Prophet's hadith is saying that what? When his voice called out, everything that was physically obstructing it fell. And his voice was able to reach the different parts of the earth. And people were able to hear him. The hadith says, until even the children that were in the wombs of their mothers were able to hear the resonance of this call, which we know till today. I mean, you'll see like all these like hipster moms putting like classical music on their stomachs and their kids. Like we know that when kids are in utero, they can hear, right? And do that with Quran, by the way, for all of you, inshallah, who are going to have children, inshallah, inshallah, may Allah make them healthy. Play Quran for them. So the hadith literally says that they were able to hear this in utero. Okay? Now, another verse, another concept that I wanted us to, to understand, and this is again going to, I want to just, today my goal is just to absolutely beat down the helplessness and the despair, because really that is what Shaytan and his best friend, the IDF, are trying to accomplish, <laughs> is, is that they want people to think that there's no hope. Wallah al-Azim, Wallah al-Azim, they want every Muslim across the world to look in the mirror and say, in this you are useless. Right? And that's why everything that Muslims are doing and attempting to do is frustrating and flustering and breaking systems. And that's why the responses online, especially, but also in person, right? May Allah Ta'ala protect them, are so harsh because they are frustrated beyond belief. And you'll see it. You'll see them break down. You'll see interviews. We've all seen the same things. I know we're all in the same algorithms, but I'll make a point about that later, inshallah. You've all seen representatives from the government saying things like, I curse Amnesty International. What kind of like insanity are you talking about, right? I condemn you, you feed children. The, the, like, it's an embarrassment, but that's a sign of someone who's guilty. And that's a sign of someone who's flustered. And they don't know how to respond and they're trying to hide truth. And so as many people, much smarter than me, much more, input, much more in, in touch with reality than I am, people like Sheikh Omar, may Allah preserve him, I don't think he slept more than one hour every night this week. The, my, the man is on a plane more than he's on the ground. And he's giving talks and rallies and making dua and attending vigils. May Allah bless him. And everybody who is. Wallahi, everybody who is. There, the idea that is being told to us, right, disseminated to us from people on the ground as well as people who are here, is that the work is actually working. The efforts are actually bearing fruit. So in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala tells us this. To Allah belongs everything. See, when Shaytan wants you to spit to despair, the first thing he wants you to forget is who's in control. Despair is born from the idea that Allah is not in control. And that's why when the Muslims were experiencing the pain that they were experiencing in Mecca, what did the Prophet remind them always? He focused on what? Tawheed. 
He did not focus on battle strategy primarily. There were, of course, discussions about operations and things like that. But he wanted the Muslims' hearts to be comfortable knowing what? That despite the trial that we are in, I know that my Rabb is in control. Allah is in control of the heavens and the earth. And in Arabic, when you, when you talk about two different things, night and day, heaven and earth, it also means everything in between. Right? It's one of the ways that the, the, the linguists speak. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا And Allah is sufficient and is the best one that you can leave all of your affairs to. The one that you can trust. And this is where the word wakil, this is where the word tawakkul is derived from. This is where the phrase hasbun Allah wa na'mal wakil, that I, Allah is sufficient for me and what an incredible disposer of affairs, the one who takes care of everything, what an incredible executor of affairs Allah is. So let's talk a little bit about this concept of Allah and him being wakil. Wa tawakkal ala al-hay. Allah Ta'ala commands us in another verse, place your trust in the one that is always living, ever living. Allah Ta'ala is never absent. He's always present. Alladhi la yamut. He is the one that will never die. So you are experiencing and witnessing death and destruction. The one who is in control that you're calling upon is the one who will never die. Wasabbih bihamdihi wa kafa bihi bi dhunubi ibadi khabira. That and worship him, praise him, extol the glorification of Allah Ta'ala. And he is, it is sufficient for him that he is aware of everyone's sins. Isn't it interesting how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combined remembering and praising him, trusting in him, and also the fact that you're sinful? Because what's one of shaitan's tools for causing despair? What does he tell you? He tells you what? And what, what do people say? You go, I'm going to go to the protest. They're like, did you pray Fajr? I don't disagree, by the way. I don't disagree. But what, what is one of the arguments that shaitan makes in order to discount any good work? You're such a horrible person. You're going to make dua? They need to make dua for you. You're so sinful. That's one of the things shaitan plants. And you hear this. SubhanAllah, you hear this. Even online, you'll see people write, why is the Ummah so worried about protesting? Why don't they do that? Look, look. Why are we separating prayer and, and, and protest? Why are we taking away ibadah and activism from each other? Right? The Prophet Sallallahu right after that, Kum fa'anzir. Do you know Quran? Allah told him, stand in the night and pray. The next revelation, stand and warn. They're ne they've never been separated for us. They've never been. Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, the one who opened Al-Aqsa, was a student, was a student of knowledge. You think he didn't pray? So the idea that we're telling people, hey, all this stuff is pointless because you're not, you're not pious enough. You're not pure enough. What does Allah say? Allah says what? Place your trust on Allah, the one who's ever living, never dies. Praise him. Worship him. Don't worry. He's aware of your mistakes. He's aware of your mistakes. But even though he's aware of your mistakes, he still doesn't want you to discount yourself and count yourself out of worshiping him. This is, subhanAllah, one of the stories of the Prophet ﷺ that just shakes me when I think about it. There's many, but the story of the Hijra and the Meccan phase, for those of you who are looking for something to read and to really just like repair your brokenness, you have to read the Sirah, the Meccan phase right now. Like I want you guys to find a good Sirah book. You can read it in the footsteps of the messenger. You can read Pro Prophet of Mercy. Go to the Meccan era, the first part. It's probably going to be like the first half of the book and read about the difficulties and the struggles that the Muslims went through, their complete hopelessness, their complete helplessness, not hopelessness, sorry, helplessness. I mean, walking in the streets of Mecca and seeing Muslims killed, speared, cut up. Why? Just because they said they were Muslim. And the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is witnessing this and he, is, he has to see it and it's, it's tearing him up. It's absolutely killing him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that he's seeing people that accepted Islam and as a result of their acceptance, they're being tortured and killed and he has to witness it. And he feels that pain. And he sheds tears and he cries, just like many of us. But what does he say? He's walking by and he sees Yasser and Sumayyah 
right, known as the first two martyrs of Islam. In fact, you know the, the first martyr recorded of Islam is a woman, Sumayya. Sumayya radiallahu anha, Ammar's mother, Yasser's wife, was the first martyr in, this, in the history of our tradition, of our religion. She was executed because she became Muslimah. And as the Prophet ﷺ is walking by them, and at that point again, remember, he has protection because of his family. But he, if he tries to do something, the entire community, 80 people, wiped out. They'll be gone. So he can't do anything. He, he, he has to stay alive because he has to teach this message. But he walks by them and he says, Sabran ala yasir. He, it's almost, it's not, he's not telling them, be patient. He's making dua for them. He's saying, I'm asking Allah to give you patience. Your, your place, your final resting place, like your home is going to be paradise. There's no, other, there's no other place for you except for Jannah. And the Prophet ﷺ reminded him of this himself while he was witnessing this when he was in a helpless state because that reminder is something that allows your heart to stay together. Wallahi, when I see videos and pictures of indescribable deaths, the only thing that lets me sleep is that I say, number one, the hadith says that they felt no pain. The hadith says that when the shaheed is martyred, it is less inconvenient than the bite of a mosquito. Sometimes they bite you, you don't even feel it, right? The bite of a mosquito. And that before their body hits the ground, they're already in paradise. They're inhabiting the bodies of green birds. And for the children that are taken... That they are in the care of who? Which prophet? Ibrahim a.s. They're sitting. Imagine how many people would pay for that daycare. <laughs> prophet Ibrahim daycare. The friends of Allah. Like, can you imagine? Prophet Ibrahim. And you know what? Prophet Ibrahim was such a good father to Ismail. Can you imagine? You lose your child and you're sitting there, but you have to remind yourself that the best father to Ismail is going to be my son's my daughter's caretaker well, until I get there. That is the, that's the only thing that holds our hearts together. May Allah Ta'ala give us strength and give them strength. So in the seerah, when the Prophet Sallallahu is making his hijrah, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says something so powerful and he describes it. And I want to share this with you. He says, number one, it does not matter if you do not support him. Allah Ta'ala is talking about the Prophet Sallallahu It doesn't matter who decides to support him or not? You know, we get so upset. Everyone's like, what's the deal? What's going on? Start naming countries and their leaders. Where are you? Where are you? Can I tell you something? This is good. You should call them out. But don't think that those people are somehow more useful than Allah. That's not the case. Allah will find people who can be useful and give utility. And he will humble and humiliate people that have dollars, that have power, until they see the foolishness in their own selves. So Allah Ta'ala says, it doesn't matter if you don't support him. For Allah, in fact, was the one who supported him, right? When? وَنَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثَانِي أَثْنَيْنِ That when the disbelievers, when those in Mecca who were enemies of the Prophet, they, they expelled him, they kicked him out. They were threatening to kill him unless they leave. So he left with who? With Abu Bakr. And they went... They had to go hide in a cave. I just, when I'm reading this verse, I keep thinking of the parallels right now. That people in Gaza are moving and hiding in whatever domicile, whatever home they can find. And they're with each other. And they're trying to, and they're being pushed out by these occupying force. I just keep thinking, subhanAllah, what miracle must they be experiencing? إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ one of them, the Prophet ﷺ said to his companion, لا تحزن إن الله معنا. Don't be afraid. Allah is with us. The hadith says that at that moment, they were in the cave, and the Prophet ﷺ's feet, it was a very shallow cave, his feet were sticking out. And they were like right in the front. And the, Abu Bakr said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, if they walk by, if they simply just walk by, they're going to see us it's not like we have a great hiding spot here. We're stuck. And he's basically telling him what? This is the end. Despair, right? That despair is creeping in. Everyone is vulnerable. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya Aba Bakr, 
Listen to this line, man. It says, What do you th- what would you think if I were to tell you if name two people Thalithuhuma Allah? That the third in that group was God. What would you think? Do you think that they're in trouble? Do you think that some do you think that they're not going to be in a good spot? What do you think, Ya Abu Bakr? That was what he said. And what happened? Listen to what happened, right? Remember, if you want to stay in the dunya and process everything only by dunya, it's going to be very difficult. We have to look past it, into the unseen, into the ghaib. What does Allah tell us? He tells us what? At that moment, Allah allowed this sakina, like rain. Imagine rain, how it covers everything. At that moment, sakina dropped down from the sky and blanketed them. Heart rate went down, stress off of their face, anxiety off of their face. In the Allah ma'ana, as soon as that hit their heart, everything felt better. Okay. And then Subhanallah, wa ayyadahu bi junudin lam tarawha, and Allah supported them with soldiers, right, with aids that you cannot see. The scholars say this could be two things. It could have been angels, right? Or it could have been other means of support. Like, for example, the spider that covered the cave or the bird that built the nest, all of these things. Either way, Allah's army is vast, way beyond our inventory, way beyond what we can see and what we can think. And so this ayah gives us that understanding, that trust, that ability to have hope and that Allah Ta'ala will be there. Ultimately, I want to leave everybody with this, and then I want to share with you six things very quickly, okay? When it comes to trusting in Allah, when it comes to tawakkul, there are two poles to the spectrum. Number one is the pole that says we're useless and nothing we do even matters. Leave it up to God and watch everything happen. Don't protest, don't post, don't do anything. Don't make t-shirts, don't fundraise. Just leave it. That is extreme negligence. And this, by the way, Omar, radiallahu anh, he used to yell at people for this because sometimes people who think they're really religious, they act like this. They re- it's, it's so frustrating. They abuse and they, they, uh, uh, they gaslight the religion. Huh? Is that, am I using it right? Gaslight? No, I'm not. Okay, forgive me. They manipulate the religion to make people feel like if they care from like a political level that they're like they're like defying god no omar one time there's a narration that omar he met these people and i'm not going to say where they're from the narration says where they're from for historical reasons but i'm not trying to get people to be hated on so he says what what because he sees them and he notices that they're very don't think about where they're from i see everyone thinking (laughs) it wasn't pakistan okay we know that for a fact because that place came a lot later right so relax he saw people from a certain area and he noticed that they were very like flagrant. You know what flagrant means? Like they were uh, uh, um, blameworthy in their laxity. Like they were too chill, man. Like your kid is like, what's for dinner? And you're like, Allah will provide. <laughs> yeah, he will. But he's providing through a good father, not a bum. Like take care of your kid. You can't do that. You can't be lazy and blame Allah. That's not how this works. You can't be unmotivated and blame God. That's not how this works. Negligence is not okay. So Omar, he says, who are you? Because they were like behaving like this. And they said, نَحْنُ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ We are those who place all of our trust in Allah. And he said, بَلْ أَنْتُمْ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ Which is basically you are an abusive, you abuse that relationship. You take Allah for granted, that's your problem. Like you're not trusting Him, you take Him for granted. You know how like people like in your life, sometimes it's not healthy the way you treat them. You know that they'll be there to help you and it's not healthy, right? That's what he's saying. He says, إِنَّمَا الْمُتَوَكِّلِ the one, or متوكل, the, one, the, uh, متوكل, the one who places their trust in Allah is the one who has the seed in their hand, plants it, waters it, grows it, and eats from it. Not the one who just says, Allah will feed me. They understand that Allah will feed them but they understand that they are an agent in that process. And I'm not talking about the FBI agents that are in this room right now. I'm talking about the agent in that, pro- oh, you think I'm not, okay. Um, 
that was not a joke. But yeah. So okay, we'll wait till I'm done live streaming. So you are an agent in your own success. When you stand up to protest, when you make signs, when you donate money, when you spread the word, when you talk to your colleagues and coworkers, when you make dua, when you pray, when, and we're going to talk about the steps, you are an agent in the change and in the eventual victory of the Palestinian people. And you cannot despair and give up on that. Everybody has to be all in in that way. Everybody. Bidnillah. Now, how do we do this? What are some ways? I looked up some ways that we can restore our tawakkul, that we can beat down our helplessness and hopelessness, and that we can become productive in this. Number one is that you need to remember that Allah is present in good times and bad. You have to, you know, some of this is going to be an exercise of reflection and meditation. al wakil the one that you rely on, is present in good times and bad. Ibrahim salam believed in Allah in the fire and in Mecca when he was safe. He believed in Allah in both places, right? And Ibrahim, it is not a coincidence that in one of the most contested and the oppressed cities in Palestine is called Khalil. Do you know who's buried there? I'll give you one guess. There's actually a lot. Ibrahim is buried there. Ismail is buried there. Yusuf is buried there. They are all buried in that area. Prophet Musa is buried like 30 minutes away. You know, I mean, if the graves could speak, we would know who, who the land belongs to, subhanAllah. Ibrahim is buried there. His, subhanAllah, his ability to be trusting in Allah in the pit of fire, in the moment where he's trying to sacrifice his son, following the command of Allah, when he's building the Kaaba, when he has to call out to an empty valley of mountains, to nobody, and he thinks no one will hear him, the trust is always there. You cannot and I cannot fall into the trap of only trusting Allah when it makes sense. Because then we're not trusting Allah, we're trusting what? Ourselves. You just trust yourself. It only works when it makes sense to me, right? You think that Allah can get shadow banned? You think Allah has to reset the algorithm? No, Allah does not. And sometimes, and I'll say this very carefully, sometimes, sometimes, Allah puts... Moments in our life where nothing else we do works so that we realize that we've been relying on the wrong thing the whole time. I'm not talking about this scenario. This is, this is, that would be impolite. That would be inappropriate and rude to talk. I'm talking about in general. Think of your own life. Think of the times that you've relied on yourself so much until you had to give up. And then you finally went to the prayer rug, made dua, and doors started opening. And you realized, man, I was relying on the wrong being the whole time. Right? So Al-Wakil is the one that we rely on in good and bad. Number two, when you feel a decrease in your means, you should not decrease in hope. Your hope should remain stable, the same. Always have hope. When you see that your means are decreased, the one who relies on Allah simply changes their plan. They, they try to at at attain the success from a different route, a different angle. If we put our hope to be dependent solely upon our means, then we're going to give up very easily. Because there will be very, very thin, very, very skinny, really, really, really dry times where things do not work out. Some scholars say that the passing of Khadija radiallahu anha and the passing of Abu Talib in the life of the Prophet ﷺ was exactly for training for this moment. Did you trust in Allah? Did you have hope that you would always be there? That he would be there for you? Or were you trusting more in your wife Khadija because she had the support? Or Abu Talib who was a political, he was a political legend. He was somebody that was respected amongst the Quraysh. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he calls back Khadija and he causes the death of Abu Talib. And what then do the scholars of Sirah say? It was during that year, the year of sadness, in which Allah taught the Prophet ﷺ what it truly means to rely on him. Allah took away everything from his life. The two people that he relied on the most were taken so that what? Rely on Allah alone. If that's good enough for the Prophet ﷺ, then it's good enough for us. Okay? That's true. Allah does not. Absolutely. Number three. This is a time now, and this one's going to be a little tough. Okay? Are you guys ready for this? 
There's always going to be a moment when heart work turns into heartbreak. But we have to. Our du'as are impacted directly by our spiritual state. I know that we talked about the verse where Allah Ta'ala says, trust in him, he knows that you make mistakes. But if you want your du'as to be elevated in a way that is more real, in a way that is more exp expedited, part of that is worrying about the things that you're doing. Don't shackle your du'as by knowingly and irregrettably making mistakes. Part of your activism is purifying your heart. Part of your work is purifying. We don't protest and miss prayer. We don't, right? We don't give sadaqah from money that's not halal. We don't. We don't engage in haram behaviors to achieve a halal goal. You can't rob a bank and build a masjid. I know many people are shocked by that. It's not allowed. If you want to accomplish a noble goal, you have to take noble means. Everybody tonight, your homework is to go, your heart work for tonight is to go and to ask yourself, what thing can I give up that has been plaguing my soul for the sake of Allah? Not for the sake of any people. No, no, no. For the sake of Allah, so that perhaps in that effort of making tawbah and changing that part of my life, Allah will expedite and answer my prayers in a way that he did not answer them before. How can I do that? What can I do? Maybe for me, it's like, I don't pray enough. This realization, this moment, when you see the man giving adhan on a masjid that is rubble, might be a good moment to realize that. Maybe it's, I don't you know, give enough charity. Now's a great time. Maybe it's I commit this sin over and over and over again. Now is a great time to rethink that and to stop, right? Purifying your heart will give you the ability to have your du'as answered. In a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he talks about a man that had every reason to have his du'as answered. He was in need, he was dusty, he was disheveled, he was calling upon Allah. يَمُدُّ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ قَالَ يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ He has his hands stretched out to the sky. Oh Allah, oh Allah, begging. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, unfortunately, وَمَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامٌ His food was haram. وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامٌ His drink was haram. وَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامٌ His clothing even was haram. وَغُبِّيَ فِي بِالْحَرَامٌ Everything he had, he was covered in haram. It was completely haram. How will Allah answer that person's du'as? This hadith is referring to the, the, the way that he earned his money. Everything that he bought, drink, food, clothes, everything, was impermissible. Why? Because he was earning it in a bad way. So make a commitment today to change one thing about your struggle on this path for the sake of Allah so that your du'as will be expedited. Number four, are you guys ready for this? Okay, let me give you this one, inshallah. Surah Al-Ra'd. All right, we're almost done, I promise you. We got like three minutes left. I'm going all the way back here. I'm going to read through it quickly. Whoa, what happened? Subhanallah. I don't know what movie that is. <laughs> it looks like we need him out there. Whatever he's doing. Okay. Okay. Surah al Ra'd. Allah Ta'ala describes those who endure patiently, those who endure patiently only for the sake of Allah. And they establish prayer and they donate from what Allah has given them, secretly and openly. They donate in public and they also donate in private. And they respond to evil with good. Allah Ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ عُقْبَ For them is going to be the ultimate abode. They're going to get Jannah. And then he continues to describe them. Or Jannah, he says, the gardens of eternity, which they will enter along with the righteous, with their parents, their spouses, their children. And the angels will welcome them, saying what? Salam. Peace be upon you. Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Peace be upon you for the patience that you showed, for the difficulty that you endured. Here is your home now. How excellent is your ultimate abode. Then Allah Ta'ala switches the description. And for those who violate Allah's covenant, that agreement with Allah, after it has been affirmed, who break the ties that Allah has ordered to be maintained, 
they live their lives in a completely immoral way, spread corruption in the land, it is they who will be condemned and they will have the worst abode, the worst home. Allah gives abundant or limited provisions to whoever He wills. Listen to this part. Everyone ready? This is the helplessness. People ask this. Okay? وَفَرِحُوا بِالْحَيَاةِ dunya. That Allah Ta'ala, He allows people who are evil to even have some resources and celebrations in this life. What's going on now? If you look at the tags online of Gaza versus Tel Aviv, what's going on now? وَفَرِحُوا بِالْحَيَاةِ dunya. وَمَا الْحَيَاةِ dunya. There is nothing about this life when compared to the next life except it's like the snap of two fingers. You know what's interesting, subhanAllah? This verse, it gives us a very real realization which is that people are protesting, fighting, praying for, donating, demanding justice. They're demanding rights. They're demanding human rights. And they're ultimately demanding that their home is not taken away. But you know what's crazy about Muslims? Is that the land is actually irrelevant. The place is actually irrelevant. Because when all of us 100 years from now on this earth are gone, how we behaved and whether or not we put forth that effort now is going to dictate whether or not we are in a real, a real beautiful abode in the next life. This verse is telling us that, look, one of the things that you might get caught up on is, why do they have it so good and we have it so tough? Why? Beyond the fact that there are a lot of geopolitical and economical reasons for this, why did Allah not just make it easy for the Muslims and why is he making it so difficult for us? Because, subhanAllah, as Allah says here, this is not your home. You do your job on this earth. You do your job. You defend the Muslims. You defend Al-Aqsa. You defend their right to live where they have lived and not have their homes taken from them. You do all of that. You do it till your dying breath. But once that dying breath happens, that actual moment is really for what? It's for the sake of Allah's pleasure and for Jannah. And that's why these people, the Palestinians, our brothers and sisters, that's why they don't give up. Because they understand it doesn't end here. They get that. They fully believe that. That this is something beyond them. And it's beyond this life. And that's why Allah Ta'ala continues. In the next verse, subhanAllah, He calls upon says, If the, the disbelievers say, If only a sign could be sent down from His Lord. Say, O Prophet, Indeed Allah leaves to stray whoever He wills and guides Himself to whoever turns to Him. This is what I wanted to share with you. Point number four. Allah Ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبُ Those who remember Allah, they will find a piece of their heart that will never be activated or engaged except for in the remembrance of Allah. Except for in the remembrance of Allah. How do you guys feel when you hear the adhan? How do you feel when you hear Quran. You know, yesterday, <laughs> the, 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 there were all the chants and slogans for the protests, right? From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, inshallah. Everything. But when the uncle, old Palestinian uncle goes, La ilaha illallah, everyone screamed it, including the cops. I was like, wow. I was like, we got to get those brothers a Quran quickly, right? <laughs> La ilaha illallah just livened the, everybody, right? That's what dhikr does. It unlocks a part of your heart that nothing else, no music, no podcast, I'm sorry Joe Rogan, nothing can unlock in your heart. Nothing except for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we, part of the adhkar that we say, is we say, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. We say, Bismillahi, tawakkaltu ala Allah, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. These statements I trust in you, O oh Allah. We say these things over and over again. I'm going to give you some things to say, inshallah, and I want you to take pictures of them because that's one of the ways that you can reinvigorate your heart with trust of Allah. And the last step that I'll give for tonight, inshallah, 
is to supplicate, to make dua. These are some duas that were suggested by a scholar from Yemen named Habib Omar. And I wanted to share with you these duas because a lot of us, again, day by day, feel like what? What else can I do? What else can I do? How can I heal my consciousness? I want to share with you these things. And I'll share with them, inshallah, online as well. The first is what Ibrahim salam in the Quran was quoted to have said. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. That I place all of my trust with Allah. I just pass everything over to Him. Sufficient for me is Allah and He is the best guardian. This is going to fortify your heart with tawakkul. The hopelessness doesn't stand a chance. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. What do you hear uttered from the lips of those people that have lost in Gaza? Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. The next one. وَأُفَوِّذُ أَمْرِي إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ I am handing over everything to Allah. I'm not going to be in charge of anything. Allah is going to handle this for me totally. Allah Ta'ala is the one who always is witnessing. He can see everything that's happening. He can see everything. رَبَّنَا رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا this is a dua. Look at this. The dua is starting with repentance. Oh Allah, forgive me. Why? Because when you get forgiven, your duas are elevated, they're escalated, they're upgraded. Once I've been washed away from all of my mistakes and sins, make my feet strong. And allow us to be victorious over those who have rejected, who have turned away, and who have defiantly disbelieved, okay? So here are some du'as that I'll give. I want everybody to engage in these du'as while you're driving, while you're working. You know, I was describing this to somebody today because, and I'll end with this, There's a, uh, there are a couple of students that we have here at the seminary upstairs who are uh, from, one of them uh, is from Gaza, it's a husband and wife. And last night, uh, her family Return back to Allah. 20 people. And subhanAllah, when, when I, I was just speaking with uh, the husband a little bit and he was just repeating these du'as and adhkar and things like that. And he said, like, this is the only thing that's giving me solace right now. If it's good enough to give someone like him that sense of peace and that sense of solace, then what about us when we're feeling helpless and hopeless and we're feeling guilty? and we're feeling hurt, and we're feeling frustrated, what can we do? The prescription is there. We have all been doing the protesting, the du'as, the donating, everything. Keep that up. But what I wanted to talk about tonight was the relationship with Allah that will keep your engine running. Right now you're running, and your engine is running, but you have to refuel. This is the fuel that will keep us all going. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make it easy for us. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow us to be relief for those who are being oppressed. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow those who are being oppressed to receive their right and their justice. We ask Allah Ta'ala to uplift this oppression from them and to allow them to live in their peace and tranquility. We ask Allah Ta'ala to accept all the martyred from amongst them. We ask Allah Ta'ala to accept all those who have passed away. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make it easy for those who have lost loved ones. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make it easy for those who have who have been injured, who have been traumatized, who have their lives have been changed by this entire event. We ask Allah Ta'ala to grant Sakina to them, just like he granted Sakina to his Prophet and to Abu Bakr Siddiq. Ya Allah, we ask you to send Sakina upon the people of Gaza and Palestine and the West Bank and all of the Palestinians and all of the Muslims all over the world who are struggling and feeling this pain. Oh Allah, we ask you to allow us to experience that Sakina, that trust in you, that reliance upon you. Oh Allah, push away from our hearts hopelessness. Push away from our hearts helplessness and despair, O oh Allah, and allow us to always feel connected to you, reliant upon you, trusting, O oh Allah, that you are the one who will solve our affairs. Ameen, ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakum Allah khairan, everybody. Barak Allah fikum. I will advise everybody as well, really quickly, that as you move on in life, working and uh, you know, spending time, I'll share with you one quick story. Your advocacy is changing people. On Friday, I was at dinner in uh, Anaheim, California, and our waitress, who is a Latina girl, came up to us, and she was almost in tears because my friend was wearing a free Palestine shirt. 
and she said that this this whole scenario has been destroying me like emotionally and she you know she she was like i don't know what to do so i just gave you free appetizers and she was crying and she wrote free palestine on her receipt and i just want you guys to know that this is changing people uh at the gym the people that i work out with that i see the people who work there were quiet at first and then i see them post on instagram that this is a genocide and this needs to stop and we need a ceasefire we need to send aid and this and that and these are people that again like i never thought i never ever thought that i would ever see their response their motivation be pro-palestinian and pro-justice and so i want to remind everybody that wallahi 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 your efforts are not falling on deaf ears they are not stopping people are witnessing use the relationships you have use the neighborness you have look I'm sorry, I know I ended and I'm kind of going, but just stay still for a second. Use the, the, the relationships you've built. Now is time to leverage those. You know how I've been for like 52 weeks, I'm like bring samosas to work. There's a reason. Because in relationship, like in the economy of relationships, you're allowed to leverage when you need it. That's what it means to be a community. If I need help, I'm going to ask you for help. And so don't, I, I'm not saying that you should go and start knocking on doors and meeting people for the first time. Hi, what's your name? Free Palestine. <laughs> that might be, it might work, but it may not. What I'm saying is if you have friends and coworkers and colleagues that you've been having coffee with and lunch with and texting and making plans and this and that, now is the time. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. If you feel shy, go watch some videos and then go get, build yourself up and say, hey, I'm telling you this because you and I are close and I couldn't imagine you experiencing pain and not sharing with me. So I'm experiencing pain and I want to share it with you. And wallahi, I'm telling you, Allah has put goodness in the heart of every person and they will see it. If you speak it, they will be able to feel it. You may not, they, you may not win them over immediately, but just plant the seed. What did Omar say? Omar said, tawakkul is planting the seed and watching it grow. Everybody in here has somebody. If you create one node of a person that gets it, how many 10, 20, 30 people do they know that will pass that on? How many, right? So do not become a person that thinks that you cannot contribute. I don't want to hear any of this. I don't want to hear it. Stop sharing. We're all seeing it. I don't care. That's not how algorithms work, by the way, anyways. Keep sharing it. People will see it. You will start to create the wave of change that you are asking Allah for. In between du'as, have conversations with people, right? We ask Allah Ta'ala to accept. Barakallahu feekum, everybody. Ersha is in about eight minutes, inshallah, in the musallah. We'll see you there. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi If you sat on the chairs, please help us stack them up. If you sat on the backjacks, please help us line them up. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.